at the, the medical and economic reality of the situation uh, for all of us globally, really, uh, around um, different countries around the world is uh, quite severe. Uh, and I know that, you know, with my day to day, I'm just personally trying to be really grateful for, you know, the simple things in life and the fact that uh, we're still able to run our business and spend time with my family at home and look after clients, both new and existing. Um, but, you know, there's certainly the reality of it for many others globally where, you know, they don't have, um, they don't have the luxuries that we have uh, and enjoying, enjoying life as much as we can. So it's been a good opportunity to kind of sit down and reset a little bit. Um, my name's Adam for people who don't uh, know me already. Um, I head up the wealth management division uh, at Blue Rock um, and uh, have done that since 2014. Uh, I work really closely with two of the two of our speakers here today, Sterling and Craig, um, and I'll introduce those guys in a second. Uh, ordinarily, um, I normally catch up with uh, with Sterling and Craig, uh, and also Tom Bignall, um, formally uh, once a month, and then for half a day once a quarter. Uh, but over the last uh, three months, uh, in particular the last couple of months, it feels like we are on the phone and the WhatsApp and zoom um every second day at the moment so uh very interesting times that we find ourselves in from an investment point of view uh, as part of the reason why we wanted to uh, replace our physical client event that was due for may um with um with a webinar so we can let you know how we're seeing things um and what that means from uh from an investment point of view um so the order of proceedings is um i'm going to run through as i normally do a very high level overview um, of the Blue Rock Investment um, Committee uh, and the structure, just to help people understand um, how things actually work from, from an investment perspective within Blue Rock, why the investment committee is important and how we work together. Uh, we've spent a lot of time and effort over the past three years putting in place a strong committee and technology and the capability to be able to um, get uh, experts together um, who sit outside of Blue Rock and also some inside of Blue Rock to help navigate through market conditions. Um, and it's really come to the fore over the past few months and having the ability to actually uh, liaise with, um, with subject matter experts who are living and breathing the global economic situation and investment markets, um, and then quickly enact changes into client portfolios, which has been part of the structure that we've put in place. So I'll do a quick run through of that, um, only really for sort of five and 10 minutes maximum. Um, obviously we're here to hear uh, from two of the smartest people I know when it comes to investment markets and uh, global economics. Um, and we'll run a bit of an interview style panel discussion uh, with Craig and with Sterling. Uh, there is a Q and A function um, via, uh, via the toolbar in Zoom. Um, so please, if you've got any questions as we go, please click on the Q&A in the toolbar, add the questions. I'll keep a bit of an eye on it. And if I think the questions are kind of relevant to what we're talking about as we go, I'll throw them in there. Otherwise, there's an opportunity at the end to come back and, and, and ask those questions. Um, hopefully, I don't get any interrupted through any of my, uh, by my kids sort of running, running through the hallway. Um, but it's a bit, a bit of a theme of the theme of the client meetings that we're having at the moment. Um, so we'll do some Q&A at the end. There is a, uh, there's a, there's a feedback uh, form that we'll send out to everybody who's in attendance. As part of that feedback form, you can please do that because we value your feedback. Uh, we're running quite a few of these webinars at the moment across the different disciplines of Blue Rock to really try and get good information out to our community. Um, and we value uh, your feedback as to what is good, bad or otherwise, so we can continue to provide the right information out to our, to our clients. Um, and then off the back of that, if there's any further uh, discussions that you'd like to have. Um, there, as I said, in the feedback, there's an option to request a copy of the recording uh, and the slides. Happy to send that out to you. Also happy to have follow-up conversations and any of the questions that come through. Uh, if the ones that we don't get to answer today, uh, our intention is to answer each of them uh, in writing and then send that out as part of the uh, as part of the slide deck. Um, so if I don't get to them as we go, um, by all means, um, please. Uh, um, send them through because I'll, we'll get to them afterwards. Uh, one other thing I just wanted to mention before I move on is that um, all the stuff that we go through, so put the compliance hat on for a second, all of the stuff that we go through uh, uh, here today is um, obviously the views of the investment committee, the professional views of Sterling, Craig, myself, 
uh, and it obviously influences what we do in terms of directing client portfolios within Blue Rock. Uh, but none of it should be acted off uh, without seeking proper advice. It should be considered general advice. Obviously, there are some views that we're going to express which impact on what um, you could do from an investment point of view. However, you should always get advice to link that back to your personal circumstances. Uh, the speakers, so Craig Ferguson. Um, Craig joined the investment committee uh, in um, early uh, 2019. Um, it's been around for, um, in, in markets for, for a long time. Uh, so that means you've got a lot of experience, Craig. Headed up the global macro team at JP Morgan, was one of the top currency traders, or I think the top currency traders at ANZ in the early 2000s, uh, and has spent the last 15 odd years consulting um, to businesses like Blue Rock, family offices, um, and multinationals in terms of currency exposure. So he's got a real wealth of knowledge around um, the global macro landscape and what that means for directing client portfolios and in particular asset allocation, which I'll talk a little bit about um, as part of this introduction. Um, Sterling has been a, a personal friend of mine for about 15 years, um, lectures on economics, um, has regularly, uh, regularly writes for the Australian Financial Review, uh, also for the Australian, uh, now um, produces most of his content through his own business Australian Stand First. Uh, there's a lot of great content on, on his website. Uh, both um, audio, um, video and uh, publications. Um, so if you haven't seen Sterling's views, I'd encourage you to sign up for, uh, for, for his publications. Uh, we'll send a link out uh, as part of our follow up to some of those, some of that content because it is very deep, analytical and thought provoking content and really value Sterling's views on the, on the investment committee. Um, so uh, Sterling's got a lot of experience that he brings to the table as well. Um, probably one of the most well-networked people I know globally in the investment world um, and is a real asset to the Blue Rock Investment Committee. Uh, so a little bit about Blue Rock. Um, most of the people on, on the call will, will know Blue Rock really well as either clients already of the firm or of a division or of private wealth. Um, the private wealth division set up in 2014 is really there to help our clients holistically with all aspects of their wealth management and work in close collaboration with the other divisions to. Um, to provide our clients with a, um, a, a place that they can go to, to look after all different areas of their affairs. And we take that role in looking after or helping guide our clients' holistic wealth um, uh, position um, very, very seriously. Uh, the private wealth division um, is obviously a passion of mine. Um, and when we set the business up, we, we really wanted to make sure that we um, looked after the traditional areas of wealth being superannuation, investment management and life insurance, which is kind of what our industry has been built on. But at the same time, offer our clients a service where we can take a step back and sort of look at where they're at in terms of their family and their business and look at things more strategically and long term, building a financial management and estate planning um, management uh, component to that ad advisory service as well. Uh, so we are quite holistic with, with how we go about looking after our clients. Uh, but in particularly what we're here to talk about today is the investment side and to help us direct the investment um, structures of our clients. That's where we really fall back on the expertise of the investment committee. I have a firm belief to be able to properly guide client portfolios. Um, you really need to have deep seated experience that lives and breathes that whole world, uh, which is why we've got three people who sit outside of Blue Rock uh, and two internally to help us with that. Uh, from an investment perspective when setting a portfolio. So again, this is helpful information, just I guess to set the scene both for existing clients of ours will know this well. Um, and for clients who aren't clients of ours, one of the things that's really important uh, for you to have a good handle on is uh, a risk, a, your risk profile or um, your, uh, we also call it the, the investor, uh, the investor's philosophy. Um, are you investing for the short term or the long term? Are you investing for higher returns or more stability? Uh, is income a requirement? And ultimately what the risk profile guides um, is the mix that you should have between growth and defensive assets, which is a really important part of portfolio construction. And then ultimately um, this strategic asset allocation piece. So for different levels of profile, what's the long-term target that you should hold in the different asset classes, Australian shares, international shares, et cetera. And then a key function of the investment committee is to look at the, the, the suggested uh, research-based strategic asset allocation targets, but then form a view 
on how we should adjust away from those targets based on where we sit in the investment cycle and what's going on from a global point of view. And we call that um, dynamic asset allocation. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this slide later when we, when we share the views of Craig and Sterling. Uh, but this is something that we, uh, we're, we're living and breathing at the moment, talking about it very regularly, is where, uh, where do we see the risks and opportunities? Um, traditionally, we haven't um, been big holders of cash in portfolios, but as you can see at the moment, you know, cash is an area that we do have higher weights to, uh, purely based on risk and opportunity. So asset allocation is a really important aspect of how we construct portfolios. But to be able to do that, um, that's where you know, having the likes of Sterling and Craig and Tom on the investment committee to actually form this view around global macro, what that means for asset allocation, where the risks and opportunities are, before we get to um, choosing investments and portfolio construction, it really comes back to where are we at in the economic cycle and what does that mean in terms of how we should de be deploying capital. Um, in terms of then executing portfolios, this is quite an important uh, aspect to understand as well. Um, we run essentially three mandated portfolios and essentially a mandated portfolio means that once we've selected the type of portfolio that we're going to, that, that we uh, are going to utilize and we work that out with our clients uh, and the level of risk that we want to build into the portfolio, um, then once that portfolio is essentially set, the investment committee has the mandate or the discretion to run that portfolio. Uh, and what that essentially means is that instead of, if we want to make a decision about changing, you know, up, up, up in cash or down weighting cash or buying shares or selling shares or whatever it might be, the investment committee has the authority to do that. And that then means that we can be quite active and nimble in terms of how we navigate situations like this, because we can, we literally have, a, have had conversations in a morning based on economic data that's come out overnight and enacted changes in portfolios that morning, rather than spending the next two weeks making phone calls and getting paperwork sorted out to make a trade. And in the current conditions, um, not, not having the ability to move quickly uh, means that you, you well and truly miss out on, on making changes that you should make. We certainly still do run bespoke portfolios for clients who want their portfolios run and in collaboration with them and every single decision to be discussed. Uh, and for a lot of our clients, we do a combination of one of these mandated portfolios and then some uh, bespoke investment strategy alongside that. Uh, and then the nature of how we've constructed our investment solution uh, is to provide clients with the traditional private wealth offering where we run direct shares, et cetera. Uh, we've built a lower cost uh, investment solution for those clients who wanna keep things simpler and lower cost um, and use a more passive style of investment management but still using active asset allocation. Um, and then we run what we call a high conviction or a uh, unconstrained portfolio, which basically just formulates our best ideas at any particular point in time um, and doesn't really consider cost all that much. Uh, but interestingly, over the past um, over the past few months, that global opportunities portfolio has been the best performing portfolio, um, which in our suite of portfolios that we run, there's just a couple of examples here. Um, because one thing that we've seen over the last few months is that active investment management has really come back to the fore. You know, over the past 10 years, we've seen the rise of index managers and ETFs like Vanguard and the industry funds where they're very low cost and they use ETFs. Um, and the part of the challenge for active managers is when they've got a higher cost and their ability to beat a market, when there's not a lot of volatility around, there's not a lot of, not a lot of opportunity to actually move and, uh, and, and, and you know, beat the market per se and add value. So it's been quite interesting. I certainly myself, I've always been a believer in active, um, but I will start, the argument was starting to run thin with myself. Um, so it's actually been good to see over the past few months that the active style of investment management has come back to adding value um, and has restored a bit of faith in the, uh, the, act, in the active management investment world. Um, so that's certainly enough from me. Um, I just wanted to provide a bit of background, a bit of information uh, it will have been a repeat of, of things that people have heard before um, uh, who are clients already of ours. But for those who, are, who haven't had much to do with Blue Rock or are you thinking about investing, uh, whether it's through us or not, that's a bit of useful information to take into consideration. Uh, we'll sort of come back to it at point seven uh, and just throw a few ideas in there around what the right way to approach investing money in the current climate, because it can be a scenario where you, where you can end up as a bit of a deer in the headlights. Uh, so we'll give you some thoughts on some of the best way to go about investing money if that's something that you're considering doing for yourself. 
Uh, so without further ado, um, I'm going to, uh, to sort of roll into the next slide and start to talk about, I guess, the analytics of what we're seeing right now. Um, we've picked the sort of the, the five or six points here that I'll direct traffic on. As we're going, as I said before, if there's any questions as we're going through things, put them in the Q&A function uh, and we'll pick them up as we go or at the end. Um, so one of the things that we talk about at the um, investment committee um, regularly um, is where we're at in the economic cycle. Um, and then we use that to help guide us in terms of that asset allocation piece and where the risks and opportunities are. Um, and at this point, I just wanted to hand over to you, Craig, um, to talk us through uh, certainly how uh, you and Antipodean are seeing things currently. Thanks, Adam. Um, you know, Adam's already given an introduction, so I don't have to introduce myself or anything like that. But, and I think I probably would have spoken to many of you already, uh, either internally at Blue Rock or at some of the external functions. Uh, part of the process that we go about in terms of uh, the advice we give to uh, the investment committee and the, and the advice that the investment committee considers is to think about where we are from an inception uh, point at, uh, in the economic cycle. So um, this is a very stylized, easy uh, version of the cycle to understand. Uh, some of you would have seen this already uh, over the course of the last year or so, because uh, I've referred to it a few times. And um, you know, clearly there are short cycles that are one or two years in length, and there's other cycles that are uh, you know, eight to 10 years in length. Where we are now, and, and it's been quite a swift ver um, journey to, to this situation is that we're in the bottom, bottom right-hand corner of that slide, which is in recession, or at least moving with, within the first uh, quarter of negative GDP growth that constitutes a recession, uh, with recession being defined as two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. And as some of you can see, um, what we try and do here is just isolate with, by the usage of those orange arrows, some of the things that are characterizing this phase. So the first arrow looks at you know, weak consumer confidence. Well, we know that that's the case from surveys throughout the world, but also in Australia. Uh, inflation tends to peak and fall. Well, we know that that's been the case. We've seen sharp falls in oil prices, sharp falls in GDP, and we will see over the course of the next uh, three to four months falls in inflation. So again, that's the second thing that indicates we're here. Production's falling, so we're seeing uh, GDP declining uh, for the first quarter. In the US, for example, um, GDP declined by 4.8% for the first quarter. And bear in mind, we only really had one COVID affected month out of three there. Uh, the decline that's expected in the US for Q2 in terms of GDP could be far more significant than minus four or minus 5%, something more to akin to minus 10%. And that's the sort of experience um, of falling production that Australia is expected to see over the first half of the year by the Reserve Bank. That's the third arrow. The fourth arrow, short rates have dropped. Well, we know that cash rates are now as low as, as, low as we've seen them in over 40 years. Short bond yields have reflected that with the three-year bond rate being at 0.25%. Uh, now, this is important when we think further on about asset allocation and what we've done with bonds. So just kind of store that little gem in the back of your, in back of your minds and we'll return to that. Uh, bond yields have dropped um, and are oscillating now uh, near the lows. We don't have an arrow there because if you look over towards the left, uh, one of the things that we've actually um, got an arrow in relation to, which is recovery phase, uh, is bond yields bottoming out. And that's what we think is actually happening at the moment. Again, that's one of the things that informs our view around whether to hold bonds or not. We also don't have necessarily a case, uh, an arrow where the stock market is bottoming. Uh, why? Because the market's six, spent six weeks rising off its lows. We do have one arrow higher up in the economy slowing and entering recession phase, which is the stock market starts falling. We've got one other arrow further over to the left that's the stock market is rising. I think at the moment, and the, the fact that those arrows are spread indicates to us that we have a bit of a kind of a, a, a Mexican standoff for equity markets. And I think you'll understand this. It's one of the dilemmas that we have as we think about asset allocation uh, for the portfolios at the moment, which is that 
we added some risk back into the portfolios, the wholesale and the global ops portfolio back in late March, early April. Uh, but the question going forward from here is whether the stock market is going to go all the way back up to the highs or whether it's actually going to have another retest of the lows. And it's a very, very balanced um, equation on that. So the two arrows actually indicate some indecision around the stock market at this point. And that will also, you could expect, flow through into the way the asset allocation portfolio is, um, uh, is structured at the moment. I .e. We're gonna, I was just going to say, Craig, we're going to talk a little bit more about sort of what's holding markets up um, and then sort of where to from here as part of the upcoming slides. Sterling, like one of the pieces that you put out recently, uh, which I saw um, uh, a bit of a debate online um, with different people's perspectives was around a pretty high conviction view as to what's coming from a market point of view. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts and comments there? Sure, and, and I'll let uh, Craig finish on this economic cycle slide because it is important. But just to add to that and to answer that specific question, uh, the COVID-19 crisis is exactly that. It's a crisis. It's an event-driven crisis. And it sort of has interrupted the traditional, this isn't a classic uh, structural or cyclical um, downturn or recession, as Craig's very carefully explained. Um, and because of that, it is pretty binary at the moment. Uh, our market's moving back up for fundamental reasons or is something else going on? And as you alluded to, we'll talk about that in a few slides time. So Greg very quick, uh, correctly highlighted that we went from one stage of this, the, the, you know, the economic cycle graph that we're looking at here to, to a recessionary stage because it is an event driven crisis that we all obviously know about. But why that's material is when we do talk about some of the data in a few moments time, the data is designed to look at the real economy um, in, um, from a cyclical point of view, and it may not actually factor in some of the realities that we're all seeing with an event-driven crisis like we are. Um, and Craig sort of touched on that, and I'm sure he'll continue that in the next few moments. Yeah, thanks, Sterling. Um, look, just finishing off this slide, there are a couple of other things that kind of inform what we're thinking, which is well, the bottom two arrows look at commodities being weak and property prices being weak. But they're the sort of things that normally would hold you back in terms of... Um, being confident about allocating a lot of risk towards equity markets because normally you don't get a, a lasting uh, rise in equity markets until commodities have definitely um, based out or until property prices also base out. So there's still significant uncertainty um, around those factors. And what normally happens with the, the, these five different um, cycles or phases is that we, we circle around them. So, you know, for example, um, uh, during much of 2018, 2019, we were talking about the late upswing phase. Then we entered the economy slowing phase in 2019. We kind of wound the economy, the, the cycle back to maybe late upswing uh, between October of last year and January and February of this year. And then as Sterling said, you know, the nature of the event being uh, a, an initial supply shock that then produces a demand shock uh, in terms of activity and data, saw that the, we went from late upswing all the way back quite quickly to recession. Um, quite interestingly, and obviously you can see on the left-hand side, if we go back to uh, the recovery phase and as time goes forward, we'll see more and more arrows coming into the recovery phase. And probably the most important uh, arrow in that phase is the stimulatory economic policy arrow that indicates, um, or is normally, that indicates we are starting to get into recovery phase and it raises the question whether uh, the recession phase is completely exhausted or not. Um, Adam, maybe that's probably an introduction into those sort of factors going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I do want to um, talk about, obviously, um, in point five there, what drives markets up from here, what drives markets down, um, and just the nature of how uh, markets are essentially holding up and why they've performed over that period of time. And then any particularly ask you the question around the central bank and government um, intervention now and how, how swiftly and the magnitude of it versus the GFC, because I know you've both done some work there. Um, but before we get to that, there is, there's some other, um, I know you love, uh, you love your analytics, Craig, and uh, different charts and all the rest of it, which half the time I, I can't fully understand what they're saying, but that's why we've got you here to uh, help us interpret some of the data uh, and then convert that into sort of meaningful analysis and decision-making. Um, so I'll let you jump back in here and talk to talk to some of the uh, 
the slides that you've provided for us. Yeah, so sorry, 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 Craig, just before, could you maybe just explain to the audience what actually is a depression from you know, the force, uh, four calendar months of uh, negative GDP, et cetera? I think it's important that we just be very clear when we talk about depression, um, what it actually means in regards to your last slide, if that's okay. Yeah, so, um, so typically a mild recession, which as Sterling rightly said, is cyclical um, or due to an over, over expansion of business activity or something around trade, for example, like we saw in 2018, 19, tends to lead to um, a modest recession, um, which typically would have two quarters of negative GDP growth. Um, a, a crisis phase, like we saw in the GFC or in the tech bubble of early 2000s or in, like in this crisis, um, <clears throat> tends to lead to much greater uh, losses of uh, activity and much greater economic effects than what you would normally see from a relatively standard or average um, recession phase. So typically in the old days, you used to get very, very long uh, periods of negative GDP growth, often four quarters, so a full year. The new phase, which is what we're dealing with at the moment, is the fastest uh, fall into, into depression, recession and then depression-like uh, economic data that we've ever seen, uh, and also the fastest recovery out of there. So, you know, from late February to March 23, which was the market low, was basically around four weeks of equity market declines, and the equity market has been rallying for nigh on six weeks since then. But the, the charts here in, uh, indicated to, or, or displayed to, to indicate the extent of the uh, interruption um, to growth and activity, and how that interruption is looking more depression-like rather than simply um, recession-like. So the top right shows um, US weekly jobless claims. And over the course of the five weeks until the end of April, you saw, you've saw you seen 30 million US uh, being, or people being unemployed. Now, in within five, within six weeks. Over the course of uh, the GFC, it took 18 months. And by the way, that, that level of unemployed should correlate to somewhere between 16 and 17% of US uh, the labour force being unemployed when we get data on that on Friday of this week. In the US uh, great financial crisis, we saw 10% of the US uh, labour force being unemployed and it took 18 months for jobless claims to reach their, or about well, six to nine months for jobless claims to reach their peak, but it took 18 months for unemployment to reach its, its high point at 10%. So, as to Sterling's point, you know, this is one of the hallmarks of a very, very se severe economic um, contraction rather than simply a, a modest recession. If you look on the top left chart there, you can see that US consumer confidence has completely collapsed. We're seeing 30 or 40% uh, declines in consumer confidence. And if you look back over the previous, <coughs> excuse me, if you look back over the previous periods, for example, to the low point in um, 2009, the low point to 2003, and even the lows in, two th in uh, 1990 and back in 1980, you've never had such a significant jolt to uh, consumer confidence in the US. And it could be said, you know, the same survey uh, is evident in Australia, New Zealand, all other global economies. So what are the impacts of this? Well, <clears throat> The first thing on the top right relates to uh, businesses because essentially people are hired by businesses and businesses are very, very quick to, to fire and slow to hire. So what we would suggest is that while you may have seen six weeks of 30 million uh, Americans being made unemployed, they won't all be re-employed within the coming six weeks, especially once reopenings start. So you have a very slow um, recovery in the employment market. And what that means is that, um, and it's also driven by the fact that businesses tend to have very damaged balance sheets from this episode over one to two, 
quarters, their cash reserves decline quite sharply. And businesses therefore will be slower to, to recover than what uh, many currently tend to think in terms of those looking for a V-shaped recovery, you know, where you decline all the way down and you re reply, uh, respond all the way back up. I don't tend to think that's going to happen because um, the nature of the crisis and the depletion of business cash, uh, excess cash reserves means that they will be far more cautious going forward, not just in hiring, but also in doing capital expenditure and investment. On the left hand side, if you think about what happens from such a, a sharp fall in consumer confidence and think of your own experience over the course of the last two months here, um, when you've seen something like this, do you all of a sudden go out when Daniel Andrews or any other Premier in Australia or Scott Morrison open up the economy again and just go crazy? Well, the answer is probably no. You, you look at it and go, well, I'm not gonna rush out and go and uh, you know, spend money doing this, that and everything else and make up for what I didn't do for the last two or three months. You may be worried about you know, virus spread, you may have looked back over the last two months and actually said, you know, I didn't mind actually saving a bit of money, you know, spend, spending a bit more time with the family. All those sort of things are the longer term impacts from such a, a dramatic uh, supply and demand shock that we've seen, which impacts consumer behaviour. So the unemployment market can, uh, the unemployment chart um, impacts business behaviour, that consumer confidence chart impacts or in, implies that there are going to be longer lasting impacts on uh, on consumer behavior and spending so those are the two things that are that we're tussling with or two of the things we are tussling with at ic which is that yes we think the uh, global economies will base in terms of the gdp con contraction in q2 and we think they're going to rebound in q3 but over the course of the year we think the expansion will be probably slower than what many people think um, bear in mind that equity markets in the US have retraced almost uh, three quarters of what they've um, uh, what they declined. So equity markets have already moved back to thinking about or factoring in all of the recovery and forgetting about these two charts and what's actually happening in terms of the real economy, which will still be evident in economic data this month in May, in June, and July. Now. The, the third chart on the bottom left there shows the extent of, and it's it's difficult to see, but I hope you can see the decline most recently and the rebound, and this is in the ASX price earnings ratio, uh, which is similar to the impact or, or similar to the price action we've seen in the US, which is that um, despite the economic data looking very weak and despite earnings uh, looking like, for example, in Q1 in the US, earnings are falling up by about between 15 and 18 percent for the quarter. Analysts had pegged it at 12. In Australia, analysts expect somewhere around a 10 to 12 percent decline in um, first half earnings, but it looks like it's going to be bigger. Now, as equity markets have declined to the March low and then risen by roughly 20 percent from that level in Australia, and as earnings have fallen, What's actually happened is that the price earnings ratio of the market has risen all the way back up to pretty much where it was in February. So it, it says that based on where the ASX is now, which is around 5,400 roughly, and based on a fall in earnings of consensus earnings expected by analysts of around 10 to 12%, the ASX is about as expensive as it has been over the course of the last 30 years. So we look at the data, we look at the expensiveness and, the, and the, whether markets are cheap or expensive, and we kind of say, uh, you know, you've got to be incredibly careful uh, thinking about ploughing back into ASX equities at this level, given that they're the most expensive we've been, i.e., you know, do we want to be making the mistake that some investors made back in February, owning equity markets just thinking they continue to rally when they're actually the most expensive we've seen in history. And the and other thing also, sorry, I'll just finish Adam with this point. The other, the other point also is that when equity markets are expensive, they have a long way to fall and do so quite quickly based on any sort of trigger occurring. Now, just none of us could have expected a COVID episode back at the start of January or February, but these sort of exogenous episodes are the sort of things that, are, that 
produce a very, very quick rebasing of equity market prices, i.e. index prices and stock levels, back to neutral levels. Um, and they occur quite quickly and they can occur from a, a range of different, event, different events. So the lesson of February and the lesson of maybe 1999 or 2000, when you can see on the basis of that chart that price earnings ratios were last back at 17 times, is that something tends to occur to drive um, uh, equity prices lower. Adam, were you gonna raise, ask a question there? I was just going to say that with um, um, you know one of the things that we've grappled with around sort of the where to from here um, aspect is um, markets have been holding up um, and there's the the case for why markets do hold up and and actually rise as we yeah. come out the other side of COVID. Um, but from a PE perspective, like looking at that chart, um, it's fair to say that markets are, are pricing in a v-shaped recovery on the other side of this rather than the u or the l that others have been talking about yeah and that's right our, our view or, or my view my advice to the ic is that we're not going to get a v recovery we'll probably get something a looking a little bit more like a square root which is we have a big decline and then a, a move back up and then kind of sideways moves or something like a, a u or you know, if things go bad and geopolitical and political risk uh, raises its head, which we'll talk about a bit later, uh, then we may get something more akin to a, a U or a bathtub rather than a square root. But I think it's gonna be a lot harder path than many think based on the fact that the data damage has really long negative feedback loops in terms of what happens with businesses around their tendency to employ and to produce capex and also consumers around their spending patterns and also thirdly the fact that markets aren't cheap however what has happened and what has fostered the uh, market consensus and uh, around the v recovery and the sharp rally in especially us equities is that bottom right chart there which is that the fed balance sheet after they uh, announced qe in mid to late march has already been put in put to play uh, put to work and the left axis shows um, trillions of um, uh, balance sheet size. The light blue line is the Fed balance sheet. The, the dark blue is the ECB. And um, you can see that that balance sheet's gone from about four to 6.8 trillion over the course of the last six weeks. Now, bear in mind, that's a, an expansion of the Fed balance sheet of such size within six weeks um, that took six years for the Fed to um, achieve coming out of the GFC. So for example, they put on two, two and a half trillion of balance sheet expansion between 2009 and the early stages of 2015. And they've done it over the course of the last six weeks. So you understand simply because of the liquidity provision uh, to the market why equity markets have rallied. Um, we have this, and, and what, is, what, is, what this is producing is, uh, a, I guess, a dilemma for asset allocators, which is, do they buy expensive equity markets back up at these sort of levels simply because the Fed and other balance sheet, other central banks are um, expanding their balance sheets? Or do they um, get worried or remain worried about, um, about economic data? And our sense is that we we probably need to be try and be smarter, more tactical than just simply buying everything. And that's what our asset allocation portfolio currently um, reflects. The next slide that Adam's just brought up looks at earnings because ultimately over time, equity markets uh, are priced according to where earnings go. And on the, the top uh, left-hand side, you can see a range of different uh, earnings outlooks for the ASX. Uh, that's e EPS, earnings per share for the index, as you can see on the top left of that, that top left chart over a number of different years. So now you can see um, that uh, of the, the dark line is 12 months forward, for example. Uh, the yellow line is fiscal year 22. Uh, there's a green line in there or a red line in there for fiscal year 21 and 20. But as you can see, they're declining quite swiftly. You can see this on the bottom line, uh, sorry, the bottom chart also where um, NTM and long-term 
EPS, which is yellow, blue and yellow, are both declining sharply. So, you know, we've had a fall in US first quarter earnings. We've seen banks in particular in Australia report further falls in earnings for the half year uh, to the end of the first quarter. Uh, we won't get a lot of visibility from, visibility from Australian corporates um, until the end of Q2. So their results will come out towards the end of July, start of August. But essentially we've got another two or three months of earnings falling. We may still see earnings fall in Q3. Uh, that the market is betting no, but you know, longer lags from consumption and business activity and a slower restart of economies, for example, would give reason for concern that earnings could still fall in Q3. But the, so the, the, conundrum, the conundrum that we face though is that you know share markets are normally three to six months forward looking as to what the scenario looks like beyond what's happening right now. Um, and with the may, way markets are behaving, markets are suggesting that you know we go through short-term pain in terms of earnings, uh, but then things do rebound. And I guess one of the fundamental differences between what we're experiencing now versus what we saw back in the GFC, uh, and Sterling, by all means, jump in uh, after I make this comment, uh, was that it took the Fed uh, and other central banks a long time to act, whereas in this instance, they've come in uh, with unprecedented levels of intervention, both at a government and a central bank level, uh, obviously because economies have literally just stopped. Um, and then what markets are grappling with is the level of that intervention. Uh, and as we start to come out the other end of this uh, event-driven uh, issue, um, how do earnings actually recover? So that conundrum that we face is around once we once the skies do start to part in terms of the, you know, the, the medical impact of this, what does it look like on the other side? Uh, and that's obviously pretty hard to pretty hard to forecast. But if you're on the side of, you know, the V-shaped recovery and things actually getting back off to the races, so to speak, versus things dragging out and taking a lot longer to recover, uh, then if you're in that secondary camp, then uh, which is where we currently sit, uh, but being mindful not to be one-eyed about it, um, then you, you have to be have a mind a, a, a mind for defence at the moment. Sterling, do you want to take that up or do you want me to continue? Sure, I'll just make two very quick points. Um, look, we, you don't have to be an economist or market you know, a pundit to, to know what is causing this, which is the COVID-19 um, crisis. Until there's a medical cure, we're, we're going to go around this circle economically, globally, until there is a solution. So these conversations are all important, but the real focus for everybody is obviously focusing on what the event-driven crisis is being led by, which is which is medical and making the assumption, I'm more referring to North America, that you know, the, the recovery is gonna happen in the coming weeks because of the current wave, um, uh, the, you know, the, the people getting ill by the current wave is coming, is tapering off, in our opinion is, is very naive. We're gonna have at least two or three years of this um, and not to discount any of the economic things, but none of us can predicate what's gonna happen economically until we, we you know, deal with the virus, which is just very commonsensical. Uh, the other point I just want to quickly highlight, which sort of complements what both Adam and Craig just touched on, is the last event-driven crisis that we all remember as the Great Recession, the GFC. And it wasn't actually called the GFC at the time. At the start, it was called the Credit Crunch. Um, in that hit in April of 2007. And at that time, we saw a significant drop in April of 2007. But we actually saw seven to 10 months thereafter of credit markets and equity markets going upwards before the big drop hit in March of 2008. So the point to make is that these crises do come, the point Craig made with regards to cycle is absolutely true that it comes, um, I'm not sure the, the analogy you used a few moments ago, Craig, but the, the point I'm making is just because, you know, the current, um, uh, medical challenges are being appeased does not mean this is over um, and we could see you know obviously this play out over the next two or three years across global markets at the end of the day the only thing that really matters is it's dealing with the virus and the disease that come from it. Um, it it's a pretty obvious statement but I think people in when we talk about the economics and the finance elements do treat it like a binary issue um, and until we do have a, some clarity on that we're going to have this type of conversation for the next two or three years. Yeah, I, I'd pick up that, that, that both those points. On the latter one, 
Um, I think Sterling's outlined quite clearly with the GFC experience that, um, you know, we, we don't have clarity as yet as to whether this is a GFC-like experience or, or simply just a, you know, the worst thing we've ever seen that lasted for four weeks. Um, and I think as a result, as Adam said, I think the, the most appropriate thing in portfolios is to increase cash ready to deploy. So we can talk a bit about that late down the track. On the virus issue, um, the US is in a particularly, um, in my view, perilous sort of state. Despite all the optimism around the case counts and reopening, they've, they've got an interesting, you know, which is probably what you get when you have a guy like Trump at the helm. Uh, they've got an interesting dilemma because they've flattened the curve at a what appears to be so far a 25 to 35,000 per day case count. That's their idea of flattening it. So you, the curve steep, steepens and then flattens out at the high without falling. That's what's actually happening at the moment. Whereas in Australia, we have a flat curve because we've come down the other side of the normal distribution. They've just come up and flattened up here. So it doesn't, it's not yet clear that they've come all the way down the other side of the normal distribution like we have. The other thing also is that if you look at most of the um, US states outside of, even those outside of um, New York and California, 26 or 27 of the states actually um, have rising case counts over the last 14 to 21 days. Because I, as the guys know, I track this every day. And um, that means that once you get people mobility coming back in, you're gonna have a, a serious issue in terms of case counts rising again. And then there's gonna be a dilemma for policymakers, whether they shut things down again or whether they continue reopening. It looks like they're gonna continue reopening, but it does mean that that is gonna be a factor that markets haven't priced in yet, but which they need to deal with. So I think and that kind of, I think that kind of rolls into the, into the next point here. Craig, which is around, you know, why markets holding up with, I think we've somewhat addressed this already, but uh, which kind of links back to the stimulus and measures that have been taken. The question is, is that enough to actually see us through and, and out the other end and back to some sort of corporate health, albeit at lower levels, given where markets have stabilized below their highs. Um, but we sort of touched on that earlier. Um, and then I guess, I guess the, uh, the, the issue for, for investors who are, going about doing it themselves uh, and also for us is, you know, with where we sit right now and it does lead into the next one as to what we're doing. And I'll briefly touch on that, um, uh, but at a pretty high level um, is around what do you do given that, you know, markets have been persistent in holding at these levels. There's negative news that comes out a couple of weeks ago, we had the, the oil price issues. Then we see some more Corona issues and markets, yeah. the volatility flares up again. Yeah. And then there's some news around, you know, case counts starting to ease and markets respond really positively, positively to that. So it's this real push and pull scenario that you mentioned before and how do investors, na uh, investors navigate that? Yeah, so I think there's, in the, sh the short answer there is that what, what uh, we're trying to do is look at assets that are cheap. Uh, we don't want to be going back into owning you know, the ASX more broadly at 18 times or ASX industrial companies at 20, 22 times or 23 times earnings. What we're looking for is cheap uh, places to place money. So some of you will have seen in your portfolios uh, six or seven weeks ago, we bought uh, gold and gold stocks. Um, not every portfolio, but in some of the higher um, uh, risk tolerance portfolios. And those investments have done very well. Uh, we've most recently reduced some of um, the allocations to US equities and increased China equities, simply because we think China is through the crisis, um, far more independent in terms of being a, an enormous economy that um, the Chinese government can simply support, continue to support uh, with domestic internal consumption. And Chinese, you know, assets uh, or equity markets are trading at 13 times, not at 20 times. So they're the sort of things we're doing at the moment to um, try and get us, try and make sensible allocations um, to equity markets. We're also increasing our turn, alternative asset um, portfolios. And um, Adam's just brought up an indication of what the asset allocation can look like across the asset classes. Um, those alternative, uh, Assets have, and the allocations there, have probably been one of the major reasons why uh, the wholesale and the global ops portfolios have outperformed. 
Um, so we're, that's one of the things we're also doing. Uh, we've reduced our fixed income and bonds simply because uh, when government bond yields go all the way down and cash rates go to zero, what actually occurs there is that while bonds provide coupon income, i.e. interest income to you, they also are at capital risk because if, for example, the Fed was successful in its balance sheet expansion process and global equities went all the way back up to the highs, then what probably would happen is that long dated global bond yields would actually start to rise. And if that occurred, you'd actually get uh, a, a capital loss offsetting your income or coupon loss from holding bonds. So what we've done is move all of our uh, money out of bonds. And bear in mind, back in February and March, we had a lot of bonds in portfolios. Cash rates got cut, we got out of them. But what we've done at the same time is move out of bonds and move into cash, as you'll see on the bottom, second bottom right there, uh, ready to deploy. Uh, we've kept infrastructure in the portfolio because they tend to have long dated assets, despite the fact that some of the airports aren't working or even open at the moment. Uh, there are a whole range of other assets around infrastructure, for example, roads, pipelines, um, you know, things like that, that uh, utilities, for example, electricity companies, um, and they continue to pay uh, good income, which would be much, um, uh, much more secure than fixed income and bonds. And listed property, we've got an underweight to, um, I think everyone can probably relate to what's happening in commercial property with and domestic property uh, in, around residential with the um, rental uh, um, bans, I guess, or, or delays and uh, reductions, and they make listed property still a, a troublesome asset class. So th that probably explains where we've gone in terms of the um, asset allocation. That Australian shares arrow has moved back up um, and certainly moved back up when the Aussie dollar was back down at 55. Um, one of the big considerations is not just what Australian shares earn, but also how cheap the Australian dollar is relative to the US dollar. So uh, one thing um, we've tried to do, and we did back in March, was increase our allocation to Australian gold shares in particular. And I could anticipate that when we put the cash to work, and hopefully if this Australian equity market falls and the Aussie dollar falls a bit further, we'll be increasing those Australian shares back up um, for the first time in probably two years. Um, I, I guess I guess it's worth just um, making the point as well around like this dynamic asset allocation style of investing is that it's um, there's certainly two schools of thought and there's a lot of um, seeing a lot of my peers online at the moment you know re re reinforcing the long-term investment approach and sticking with the strategy um, and there is merit in that um, because unless you're in a situation where you can actually enact portfolio changes quite quickly and you have the macroeconomic and asset allocation expertise to do it, which is primarily the reasons why we've got Sterling and Craig as part of the solution in order to direct that traffic, um, making these types of calls and reviewing them, adjusting them in a DIY strategy is very difficult to do and fraught with danger. So if you're not in a structure where uh, that expertise is sitting around it, um, then whilst this type of discussion is interesting to kind of direct, um, to give you our views on what's going on around the, around the world and what ideas you might think about, it's also something just to be mindful of if you, if you are investing money yourself and trying to move things around because often you can get those calls wrong and it ends up leading to um, a worse outcome than just sticking with your long-term strategy. Because yeah. those clients who, you know, I often talk about people who invested back in 2007 um, if they got too cute with their strategy in 2008, then uh, they probably um, blow up their portfolio even even further compared just to sticking with that strategy for five years. If they had good quality investments, it would have come through it in pretty good shape. Um, but the nature of the structure that we run allows us to be a bit more dynamic with this type of structure. Adam, um, just before we go on, I'm just looking at the Q&A and maybe it might be appropriate just to um, answer a couple of those questions just quite quickly. Yep. Um, the first one was in relation to the hit to earnings in the short term and whether the market's looking through that. Uh, yes, the market is looking through that and it's assuming that earnings recover all the way back to where they were. Uh, however, the problem is that equity markets really barely uh, priced in the fall in earnings that we're going to see in the first half. So we're expecting somewhere around a minus 40% fall in earnings over the first half. 
Uh, the ASX got to minus 37 at the lows, 37%. So um, they, they really didn't price much more than that. Um, in addition, markets are now expecting a move all the way back up in earnings, but we tend to think that earnings, and most of the analysts um, that, we res that I respect, are still suggesting that earnings will probably be down about 20% over the course of the full year. So bear in mind, we have another six or seven months to go. Uh, the equity market here is down about 25% at 5,400. Is that right? Probably, it's about right. Um, so that's in relation to earnings. The other question was how the Fed has raised their balance sheet so quickly, and is it sustainable? Yes, it's sustainable. The Fed can keep buying government bonds for as long as they want, and it looks like they're going to. Um, the balance sheet rises because what they do is they go out and they buy government bonds from the private market and give them cash. The, the, uh, the size of the cash um, that they then put into the market then flows into investments. That's the reason, most simply, why equity markets have gone up as a result of that. Um, in, the third question was in relation to um, COVID and it was around whether economists are guessing on it. Well, yes, we are to some degree, but we try and make sensible decisions and assessments regarding it. And I think probably the most sensible assessment, I think it's one that without putting words in Sterling's mouth, that he and I both share is that um, there's, where we are now in May, um, there's still a significant window of time, maybe three or four months until, um, or at least three or four months until um, vaccines come down the pipe, maybe much longer than that. Uh, and also our, my view in particular is that reopening of global economies, especially in Europe, uh, and in the US will probably lead to not just a second wave, but a continuation of the current wave in terms of case counts. The third aspect also is that the emerging market economies are only now having a major, being majorly impacted by COVID. They're about six or eight weeks behind the rest of the world. And emerging markets has been the fuel for most of the global growth over the course of the last five or 10 years, not developed market economies like Australia and US. So it looks like emerging market economies will be weak for quite a while. Um, supply chains was the next question. Will they continuing to be uh, impacted? They don't look to be as impacted as poorly as what we think. Manufacturing surveys have fallen, but they haven't fallen anywhere by, by anywhere near as much as uh, service sector uh, economies so, um, uh, and service sector data. So it looks like supply chains are being normalised and just as we're working the way we are here, uh, managers and manufacturers of products uh, are working in the same sort of way. Um, the last thing I see is, sorry Adam, I'll just finish quickly on this, is um, yeah. the investments in alternative assets and infrastructure. So we use um, a manager uh, in particular to that looks at, has, uh, um, infrastructure assets, listed infrastructure assets in the US and in emerging markets, about 40% of those assets are in emerging markets um, infrastructure. And in alternative assets, we look at um, hedge funds and global macro strategies and long short equity funds, uh, as a, which are not correlated towards the equity market as a way to ensure portfolios work. Yeah, I was just uh, just conscious of people's time because we're at two fifteen, and, and um, just wanted to make sure that we. So, if there's any other questions, we can sort of come back to them later. Um, obviously, as people need to drop off, um, please do, um, and then we will make a recording available, so you can certainly refer back to the last part of the presentation if you've needed to leave or have left, or, or sorry, if you need to leave. Um, I uh, I might just throw across to you, Sterling, just to uh, on this particular point here around um, what drives markets up, what drives markets down from here, um, and then the way that you're sort of looking at things in terms of the investment decisions that you're making within your own fund uh, and what you're, what you're expecting both on the upside or the downside and what you're looking for. What drives markets up? Uh, can I plead the fifth on that question for now? <laughs> I think we are up. So there's two schools of thought at the moment that markets, uh, as Craig's been uh, alluding to, not Craig's opinion, but alluding to other people's opinion that we're going to see a potentially V uh, type recovery simply because of the enormous amount of printed uh, money coming out of central banks, which 
um, as Craig and I haven't opened that Pandora's box in, box in today's conversation, but it's looking like the central banks are creeping into new asset classes without going through Congress in the US, et cetera, which is a whole category and a whole hour long conversation for another time. But why that is material is there is an enormous amount of liquidity propping up um, listed and quoted markets at the moment. That's having a knock on effect for fixed income and bonds as Craig's also talked about earlier today. Uh, with regards to why there's two schools of thought is there's another school of thought saying that real valuations that you know you, you can be as sophisticated as you like but at the end of the day companies particularly when you talk about equities can't be sustained without earnings um, and parking earnings for the next 12 months on the basis that 2021 will be rosy again is a very very dangerous game to and that's exactly what markets are doing at the moment and what that means is that if it isn't sustainable and that the the printing presses at the central banks can't keep us at the levels that we're at that obviously true valuations are going to be a lot lower than where we're seeing them at the moment that's just from a fundamental liquidity point of view with regards to what can drive markets down again we can talk um, for hours on this but what is important to to highlight is as we've all talked about several times now the the covid um, is the cause of all this and we need to all focus on that we obviously have geopolitical tensions all around the world linked to this and obviously you can't have 85 percent of the world's developed economy stopping to a grind at the same time and expect that things are going to bounce back um, in, in any form that we've recognized. This has never happened in human history, let alone anything since 1929. What is also important, of course, um, and anybody who has read our commentary knows that we focus on is the growing tensions in the South China Sea between um, Japan, China, obviously in the US. And it's not ap academic, nor is it immaterial. It has a, the Australian economy and our bond market, our currency, and obviously equity market is extremely closely correlated to our relationship with mainland China. Um, what's happening obviously in the region is greatly dis disturbing. And people obviously um, have focused on China in the last 15 or 20 years, but our economy is still very closely aligned to Japan as well. It's still a fundamentally important part, both economically with also regards to the stability of the Australian dollar. Um, and if Japan has issues with the region, it also affects Australia as well. So there is a plethora of downside externalities at the moment. Um, and why they need to be focused on is not to, to uh, wish that we go to the downside, but to manage risk and to not consider those factors at this time is just naive of anybody, whether you're actively in markets or you're staying on the sidelines. These have serious consequences. And uh, the only way that any market will go back up uh, with some actual velocity or some support levels is when economies start going again, there's productivity growth. And when these externalities are you know, expanding at the rate that they are at the moment, we all need to focus on those simply so that we can hopefully resolve them and then go back to doing business. Thanks, Sterling. I'm going to um, just basically skip through this next one very quickly um, and sort of not open this one up other than a couple of things that we were going to touch on was gold, which we've already spoken about. Gold still does feature in our portfolios. Um, landmines, we've had you know, a couple of discussions over the past few weeks, both uh, the investment committee and then um, some people overseas as well around oil and um, is oil a, you know, an opportunistic play for portfolios? The nature of investing into oil as, a, uh, as uh, through a traditional investment portfolio like what we run is that um, instead of actually owning barrels of oil, we need to own uh, investment vehicles that replicate what the price action of oil is and uh, they're called futures and there's a lot of risk in that part of the market at the moment. So we thought we might talk about that as a topical discussion, uh, but given time, uh, we'll just we'll leave that one there. But things like that we do certainly talk about to sort of expand the horizon as to where are the opportunities and, um, and, and obviously where are the risks. We've talked a fair bit around obviously the, um, the, 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 the downside and where markets are currently sitting, um, what that means in terms of decision-making and asset allocation. You can see through our asset allocation that holding more cash and holding more alternatives, we are mindful of the downside right now. However, we are also very mindful that markets um, can go against what the view is. So when we have these discussions, you know, on a weekly basis or multiple times each week at the moment, we're also looking at the upside scenario as well to say what does drive markets up? Uh, what, what, what is the risk of sitting too defensive and having markets run away from us? 
And then from an investment point of view, one thing that we will never do is we'll never get the timing perfect. So when the discussions we're having with clients about investing money or us about deploying money at an investment strategy level, we know that we'll get that timing wrong. Uh, what we're trying to do is get it uh, as, as, as right as we can or somewhere thereabouts. Uh, and that there's, you know, there's obviously an element of analytics that's involved in, in that. Uh, there's also an element of guesswork. Um, so that the, the, you know, to try and take, to, to reduce that risk um, and for people, so, so we don't get caught in the headlights, both at a client level or at an investment committee level. Um, what we also need to then go back to is investment 101, which is a long-term focus and having good quality assets and investing through the cycle. So it's kind of balancing those two approaches together, being flexible, being long-term focused. Uh, and then not discount the opportunity that, that we that we have in front of us as well. Because times like the global financial crisis, I mean, I started advising clients in 2007, it was a baptism of fire. Uh, but what I saw during that period is the ones who came out of in the, in the best shape were the ones that either stuck to their strategy or actually invested more during periods like that, did the opposite to what people people were, uh, were, were feeling and, and, and how they were behaving. Um, so whilst we are very focused on downside and as an investment committee, that's our role. We're the custodians of our clients' wealth. Uh, we would rather in the current climate protect money uh, rather than chase, uh, chase the return right now. But what we are doing is getting ourselves ready. So for clients who are wanting to invest money or in portfolios, we've got those cash positions there and we're talking about what we are going to invest into because this situation can uh, obviously play out and, and, and rapidly evolve within the space of weeks or months. Uh, and the reason why we're defensive is because we feel that there's more pain to come, but we could be wrong. We're talking about that weekly. Uh, but if we do see further downside, we will very quickly, those dials will move to green and we'll be buying good quality assets that then give us good upside growth because times like the GFC 2009, you know, the four or five years beyond 2009 were, was a great time to be invested. Um, and it's very likely that once we come out of the come out of the, the other side of this, that there'll be some really good returns to be had. So we're we're, we're making sure we maintain fo focus on that as well. Um, so we have uh, we have used our time. I can see that um, most people are still um, still sort of in the webinar. Um, but I would like to thank everybody for uh, for coming along. Um, as I said, there um, uh, we'll open up to we'll cover off a couple of other questions in a second. Um, but I, we will send out an email with a, with a feedback form, uh, value feedback, as I said before. Um, and uh, thanks for those who have sent questions through. Feel free to leave us now, uh, but we might just jump into the Q&A um, panel, uh, Craig and Sterling, uh, and just pick up any final points that you have to make and also address any questions uh, that we feel are, are relevant to cover off before we finish. So with what I've said, Craig, around the, um, the uh, I guess how I've wrapped that up from where, where we're at and what we're thinking about from an investment committee and then obviously focusing on risk, bit, but looking at the opportunity, um, what, are your, what are your additional thoughts on, on, on what I've said around sort of where to from here? Well, look, I think, um, I think as Adam indicated, you know, my, my bias in terms of the advice around the portfolio is to, is to own own things that make sense, um, to increase cash, uh, to protect portfolios more so, and certainly if equity markets cheapen up, then we'll be certainly be putting more place to work, uh, more, more money to work, I should say. Um, in relation to uh, some specific opportunities, for example, around oil, uh, I, I think there are a couple, uh, one in the broader com commodity sector and one in the currency. Um, oil is part of the commodity sector, you know, clearly having negative oil prices two or three weeks ago uh, is unparalleled. Um, it indicates that oil prices are basing out. When we come out of that, what's the, what are the impacts of that? Well, um, you know, ideally you want to be owning uh, energy related or diversified uh, energy mining companies. So for example, with BHP or there are other candidates in Australia that have more pure energy sector exposure. So they're what we'll be looking at, but we don't do direct equities typically. Uh, so we'll probably look at maybe a diversified resources manager or something like that to do that. Uh, in relation to um, 
you know, ethical investments and renewables. You know, I think you probably want to touch base with Adam um, on that because there are a number of, um, you know, solar investment opportunities and things like that, which we've been working with wholesale clients on, um, which I think are useful for people. In relation to the currency, uh, I do tend to think that we'll probably get one more new low in the Aussie under 55 cents, but down there, I think the currency is probably going to be basing out. And if it does, then it ends the eight or nine year down cycle that we had from 110. Uh, most people can't even remember 110 uh, relative to the US dollar, but we actually did reach a 10% premium to the US dollar back in 2011. And that equally just as um, transparent and short term, ultimately that was, so will us be uh, so will be us as an Australian dollar, uh, you know, denominated country being worth 50 or 55 or half of um, the US dollar. So I expect a long-term base down there. And what that does is it says to us that we don't want to be owning too many US or global assets, but if we do, we have to have them currency hedged. And that also foreign investors will probably find Australian assets far more attractive than they have over the course of the last five or 10 years when the currency gets down there. So I think we can probably expect to see quite a degree of foreign buying into Australian equities primarily, but also um, foreign direct investments into underlying assets over the course of the next year or two, if the currency gets weaker, which I expect. So that's- Could I just, could I just add something to, to Craig's comment? With regards, when we look at on the IC, look at oil as a um, as we have in today's presentation, we're talking about oil in the global economy. So it's not just as an investment or something that we're looking to purchase or participate in it in an, in and of itself. Oil is and will continue for the next twenty years to be a fundamental part of the global economy. Um, whether that is ethical or not, with regards to uh, direct investment, is its own conversation. But I just want to make it very clear that when we do talk about oil in these contexts we have to deal with the world that is around us and oil is obviously a very important part. And it's, and if you don't look at it, uh, when you look at the macro backdrop, you're not doing any of us a service. So it is very important that we look at oil. Uh, doesn't mean that we endorse buying oil directly or anything like that. They're, they are really two different conversations. All right. Well, um, look, we might, we might leave it there for today, but I'd, yeah, I'd like to thank um, Sterling and Craig uh, for their time and contribution to the investment committee. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's very interesting times we find ourselves in. Um, uh, we'll, as I said, uh, please send through your feedback. We're happy to make the slides and the recording available um, and also uh, very happy to sort of open up the conversation and have a chat about sort of what you're thinking and doing, whether it's a portfolio that we currently work with you on, um, or, or if you're not a client of Blue Rock, happy to happy to have an initial discussion. Um, and uh, if uh, if you're also not receiving our email updates, then please let us know um, because we can add you to the, the the regular communication that we're that we're sending out. And uh, hopefully next time we get to see you, we get to see you in uh, in back in back in the office. But if not, we'll see you on another webinar sometime soon. Thanks very much. Thanks, Adam.